Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Comic Art Live. John Suntress here from the Word Balloon Podcast. And I'm really excited for this hour. You're going to have a lot of fun because this guy's been cracking me up for years. It's so great to welcome him back. The creator of Grendel, the creator of Mage, and excellent work on so many iconic characters over the years. Please welcome Matt Wagner to the broadcast. Good to see you, Matt. Hey, John. How are you, man? Right I'm just here trying to remember the last time I actually saw you in person. I can't quite remember when that was. I know, my man. It's I, I literally hope to see you every San Diego. I was even at Rose City last year. Oh, I wasn't last year. But Baltimore, I know. you're usually at Baltimore too, and I'm often there. So <laughs> Emerald City. Yeah, man. No, you know, I gotta plan my West Coast trips to hopefully see you. And now thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, because I've got tinfoil wrapped around my butt, Matt, because I've been having <laughs> internet dropping issues. Yeah. All morning, but hopefully we're going to get through this fine. But I know we've already got people uh, listening and watching, and that's great. And hey everybody, uh, thanks for showing up. Absolutely, Eli says hello. Hello, Hi, Eli. Eli. Good to see you, man. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, you know, I'll give a little plug to Eli here. Eli and his uh, partner in crime, Ben Granoff, run a uh, uh, podcast about the Grendelverse called uh, "The Devil in Details," which you can find on uh, YouTube and Spotify and iTunes. That sounds great, man. That's fantastic. Very, very intricate, man. They they go in, they go deep. <laughs> well, Matt, you know, you you I, I love the fact that you know it's thirty years later and we're still talking about Mage and Grendel, and rightfully so. More than thirty-four years, almost 40 years, 40, or almost forty. 40 years, yeah. Oh my god, thirty-nine years, yeah, <laughs> Matt. Wow, yeah, yeah. that's awesome, man. And truly, and I love how it kind of has fed into the narrative of Mage, but just you know your own kind of observation. I think subtly in the subtext of uh, of the story. Yeah, you know, I I, I say to people uh, one of the reasons the Mage trilogy took so long, of course, was it was uh, it's a reflection of my life and it's a allegorization of my life and uh, enough of my life had to pass by for me to be able to mythologize it in that fashion. Uh, specifically, the last part took quite a while. And I realized when I got ready to start it that that was because it was starring my kids, my wife and my kids. And I needed to have my kids grow up to see what sort of people they were going to be. Because I think if I would have tried to do it when they were still that age that they're depicted in the comic, I would have kind of idealized them a little bit more. I would have, uh, um, and certainly they are idealized to a great degree in the story, but uh, I knew a few more of their personal picadillos and, and understood them a little better once they had reached uh, a certain state of maturity. So that's just how long it took. It wasn't the way I planned it, but I feel everything worked out for the best in the end. That's awesome, man. Now I know you got affected by uh, pencils down during this COVID period, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, right so in the middle of the uh, my latest series for uh, my latest Grendel series for Dark Horse, uh, Devil's Odyssey, um, and it's uh, slated to be eight issues. Four issues had been published when uh, we were put on uh, production hiatus. But uh, they just recently gave me the go-ahead to finish up. So uh, I'm now working on the final issue of that. Um, it gets solicited, I think, around the end of January, and it's slated to start coming out again uh, monthly beginning in uh, April. Okay, excellent, man. And it's and a, all the Grendel fans out there, I have a, it leads directly into a sequel that uh, I'm, I'm planning and uh, doing sketches for right now, which is a, should be a cool, fun, really uh, – unexpected change in the in the Grendel verse. So <laughs> exciting. Very, very cool, man. Yeah. Um yeah, you know, God, like again, so so tell me about uh, you know, Grendel's Odyssey in terms of where are you in the story and everything right now. Well, uh when it was time to come back to Grendel, you know, when I finished Mage, I, I decided to go back to Grendel. And uh it had been a while since I'd worked on Grendel and you know it's set in that futuristic scenario where uh the term Grendel is a, a military rank, you know, and it stars the the uh, the cyborg Grendel Prime. And uh, I just decided, you know, I've done a lot of stories set in that um, that time frame and that uh, uh, narrative uh, venue. Uh, so let's let's change things up a bit. And I decided let's send Grendel Prime into outer space. He's a cyborg. He can survive space travel. And uh, and it was kind of my. Uh, my homage to heavy metal magazine, you know, uh, the early days of heavy metal magazine, you know, that was a huge influence on me when I was young. That was the first, uh, first discovered it when I was probably 15 or 16 at, uh, uh, a Kmart, I think in the magazine racks. 
And it was the first comics I'd ever seen that were aimed specifically at adults, not at kids at all, that uh, featured sex and violence and adult themes and, yeah. and had a, a completely different aesthetic than uh, the American comics at the time. So, you know, this is very much my, uh, my homage to that, specifically with, you know, having this kind of lone, lone traveler uh, uh, going through space. It's kind of a riff on uh, Gulliver's Travels as well in that he goes to several different worlds and they're each a, a kind of weird reflection of, you know, stuff that went wrong or could go wrong in our world, you know. Um, God, sounds great. That's excellent, man. Are you working on, uh, I know you're working on some uh, sketches for us. Yeah, I was just while we're talking. So, uh, while we're doing this chat here, I'm going to be doing some live sketches. Uh, I have them kind of half started and I'll be finishing them as we go and they're all for sale. Um, uh, in the Comic Art uh, Live event, uh, you can go uh, to see my art dealer's booth. His name is Jim Warden. Again, that's Jim Warden. It's very easy to find. Uh, there, that's running across the bottom of the uh, <laughs> screen. There is a crawl that has uh, Jim's information. You can contact him uh, via um, uh, Caps Hockey Fan. Oh, that's missing a C there in that crawl. It should be Caps Hockey Fan at yahoo.com. He's a fan of the Washington Capitals. <laughs> um, uh, 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 each of these pieces is $250. And if you like what you see, you can contact Jim and uh, pick them off, off him directly. Um, uh, I'll be finishing them as we go here, and I'll flash them up at the screen. Uh, we got four different pieces, and uh, we'll take it from there. Do you want to give us a preview, or are they not ready to view uh, yet? I mean, it won't take me long to finish each one, and as they're done, okay, I'll, I'll hold them up. Yeah, That sounds great. Excellent. Matt, let's go back to the beginning, because um, you broke in through Kamiko. Wasn't Kamiko your first uh, pro publisher? It was, uh, and I actually met the guys that for, uh, formed Kamiko. We all went to art school together. Um, you know, I, I often get people coming up and asking me, how did you get your start? And I said, man, I'm just the wrong guy to ask because I was in the right place at the right time. And certainly I made, uh, I took advantage of the opportunities I had, but uh, um, I got on the elevator one day at the art school and there was a guy with a Creation Conventions t-shirt on. And way back in the day, Creation was the only national convention chain. And I said, oh, comics, I love comics and blah, 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 blah. We struck up a conversation. and. Uh, Eventually, uh, he hooked me up with pals of his, which were the early uh, uh, nucleus of the of the of Kamiko. And uh, about a uh, year, two years after that, uh, they all dropped out of school to try and uh, start an independent publishing company. And about a year after that, I followed them. Uh, wow. And that led to the initial uh, black and white Grendel issues. And then at one point, they decided they needed to make the. This is just before the giant black and white boom in the eighties. And it seemed like we have to move to color. And, uh, uh, at that time they had signed, uh, Chuck Dixon and his then wife, uh, Judith hunt to do a series called Evangeline, which was about a, uh, uh, a killer nun, a nun assassin for the, uh, sure. American in the future. Im immortalized by Matthew sweets. Uh, Indeed. Song. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, if you know anything about printing, uh, it is cheaper to print two books at once due to the uh, width of the printing press. You can fit two side by side, so why not do two at once and, and maximize your costs? And uh, so they offered me the chance to develop a color book, and that turned out to be Mage. Wow. Um, uh, you know, again, learning curve all the way around in every stage at that point. You know, that for me, it was a big... Uh, Big step, I would say. I initially, anyway, I wasn't really ready for, but you know, I hit the ground running and I learned as I went. And in regards to Mage, that really works in regards to the narrative because yes. the reader kind of sees me getting my power at the same time that my alter ego Kevin Matchstick gets his power. So, um, so that all worked out well. Thank God. <laughs> Actually, you know, Matt, it's great to talk to people who have that perspective of the 80s boom and then the 90s boom and then our, our our current period that i suppose started about 20 years ago i would say in terms of where creator own really you know kind of came back yeah. with a vengeance and in the in the wake of marvel's bankruptcy and their well john's got a glitch 
Well, I get I get the uh, tag in while he. Uh... That's okay, John. John had a glitch there, but uh, but yeah, we were talking about you know the early days of creator ownership, and uh, you know it was literally just flying by the seat of our pants. You know, not uh, we just kind of knew we didn't want to we didn't want to go the normal route and uh, have all of our efforts just be lock, stock, and barrel owned by the uh, the publishing company, which was you know which was the de rigueur rule of the day. Um, uh, back in back in everything before the eighties, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and if anybody, I, nobody knows this, but I actually got to participate in a Zoom chat with you, probably a couple months back. And, mm -hmm. and one of the coolest things that you were doing and you were talking about a little bit is how the progression of how your story and how your kids grew through that story and. Mm -hmm. and and I, I thought that was the coolest concept I've ever heard. And 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 if you wanted to talk about that a little bit, yeah. Well, we talked about it a little bit earlier with John, but, uh, oh, but yeah. The, uh, the point was, I, I had to see my kids grow up, and and they did. And uh, and you know, I just feel like uh, one of the things I'm proudest about about the Mage trilogy is that. Uh, you know, it very much feels like stages of a person's life, stages of a story, you know? It, yeah. it, it certainly hangs together and is certainly cohesive. It certainly seems like it's done by the same guy, but it's done by the same guy at three utterly different stages of his life. And, uh, and again, I'm very proud of how that comes across. And uh, hang on here. <laughs> That's okay. I thought, I thought you probably too. I got nervous. Uh Nobody wants to see me. That's and, sure. and I feel like uh, I feel like it reached the point it needed to get to. I uh, I keep telling people I feel like I stuck the landing. You know that it 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 came in where it was supposed to come in. It ended the way it was supposed to end. And the funny thing about that is that I uh, I think I talked about this when we talked previously too. Um, the fact that uh, especially for Mage, uh, I distinctly tried not to think about mage during the interims between the three different stages of it, between the three different volumes of the trilogy. Um, for the main reason that I, at one point I realized, well, this isn't going to happen overnight and it's going to, it's going to take a while between the three stages of the trilogy. So I really, really, really don't want to um, get locked into any certain ideas that might become stale. If I get my, uh, get my head set on it, you know, at a certain point. Um, so again, like I said, I distinctly tried to not think about Mage. Um, and then in each case with the second and the third book, things just reached a stage where all of a sudden I couldn't not think about Mage. All of a sudden, the only creative ideas I was having were in regards to Mage. And I realized, okay, now it's time to do Mage. So it was almost like Mage decided when it was time to do the second and third volumes more than I consciously did, you know. That's awesome. Um, so is it fair to say that like your characters they they they're they're 100% built around people you know correct mm -hmm. and and so like do you ever like when you're on when you're writing something for example like batman are you drawing from that same 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 point well not so much from people i know but from situations i know okay um, um like, for instance, when I did uh, Faces, which was the uh, um, three-part series I did for uh, Legends of the Dark Knight way back in the day that featured uh, Two-Face. Um, at that point, my wife uh, had a brief stint as being a, a realtor. So I included a realtor character. I was listening to her talk about the business of realty all the damn time, and, you know, I, uh, I stuck in a, a real estate deal. Um, uh, in Grendel, I... You know, I I, um, I tend to uh, I tend to incorporate situations that I'm in more than uh, more than the personalities, like in Mage. So, like for instance, uh, when I did the Christine Spar storyline, mm -hmm. uh, I was dating a woman that I had dated previously, and when we got back together in the interim, uh, she had had a child with uh, another guy, and so for the first time. I got to see up close and personal this like kind of fierce maternal protectiveness. Okay. And, uh, and so I incorporated that into the Christine Spar character. Um, shortly after that, we had broken up. I had dropped out of school to uh, pursue comics and I was kind of 
I was living in the same area I, I had lived in when I went to the art college, but of course, not being in school, I was removed from that social scene. So I was feeling very isolated and alone. So that I incorporated that into the next stage of Grendel, into the Brian Lee Sung storyline. Um, following that, I met a woman and married into a, a big Catholic family. And so I incorporated that into the God and the Devil storyline. Um, oh. So it's, I always say that, you know, Mage is me looking in and Grendel is me looking out. Wow. Okay. Uh, very cool. That's very cool. Uh, Tom Kelly has a question in the chat. It says, uh, what do you think were some of the things changed or presented as you saw your family grow and change that you put into Mage that you didn't expect? Well, uh, I tell you one specific scene. There's the in in the Hero Denied. There's a scene where uh, uh, Hugo, Kevin's son, uh, has been distinctly told, uh, you know, you're not. They're this big. They're captured by the bad guys. They're in a um, a magical environment that looks like a uh, a uh, fancy hotel suite. And uh, the food that appears for them. There's this giant pile of glistening, beautiful, beautiful food. And it's surrounded by a ring of what looks like horrible traps. And his mother, who's a witch, tells him, you know, you can't eat the good stuff looking stuff. That's fairy food. And if you eat the fairy food, you'll never be able to leave this place. And but one night he sneaks out in the middle of the night and, and eats some of it. Well, you know, my son used to sneak out in the middle of the night and do some shit he wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> so uh, so that's how I incorporated that into that, you know. Very cool. Well, hey, John, welcome back. I'm going to phase out again. Uh, stay on uh, stay on lifeguard duty because, uh, again, uh, uh, here we go. I got the first piece ready. Oh, let's see it. There we go. Oh, hold on. I'll, uh, here we go. Outstanding, man. Look at that classic Superman. Fantastic. And I love I love that. Uh, I don't know if it's Kingdom Come or 38 Seagull or Schuster uh, logo. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the Fleischer uh, Superman cartoon. Of course it is. It. Yeah, it's the Fleischer Superman cartoon. Yeah. Th that's outstanding. So, anyway, any of these pieces, uh, if you're interested, the crawl running across the bottom of the screen is the information on how to contact my art dealer. And they are all available uh, for purchase. And let's move on to the next one. That's that's fantastic, Matt. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, regarding your, your Vertigo work in particular. It almost seemed like, who was your editor for well, Sandman, Madam I'll Sandman? I'll move on to this one then. Oh, there you go. Let's see it. <laughs> Let's see him again. Sandman one, so. Wesley. In his, yeah. in his prime, absolutely, man. So, yeah, tell me, because it really seemed like... So, you... Okay, so here's the story of how that all came about. Uh, okay. When Karen Berger was getting ready to form Vertigo, um, she, you know, uh, she liked my stuff. She had contacted me and wanted me to uh, give her a pitch on, you know, any sort of idea I had in mind. Um, uh, I particularly uh, was a big fan of Guy Davis's uh, uh, work for a book he did for... Uh, caliber comics called Baker Street. And if you've never seen Baker Street, it's a, a creator-owned book by Guy. And it's a female punk Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. uh, so modern updating of Sherlock Holmes, uh, you know, uh, uh, thoroughly outdates the, you know, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch version. <laughs> um, and it was fantastic. And so I, uh, via the uh, publisher, Gary Reed, I, con I was able to contact Guy. And uh, I said, Guy, look, I, I love your stuff. I'd love to write something for you. Um, you know, I've got this. Uh, I've got this situation at uh, at Vertigo where Karen Berger is asking me to uh, to give her a pitch. So let's think about something we could do together. And uh, I said, I tell you what, go through the DC Who's Who and uh, find some characters that appeal to you. And you know, let me know what they are, and we'll uh, we'll we'll go from there. So. A uh, little while goes by, and he sends me uh, a list of uh, uh, Xeroxes of three characters out of the Who's Who's. And uh, the hilarious thing was they were all guys wearing a hat and a cloak. You know, <laughs> a long um, uh, but one of them was the Golden Age Sandman, and he had a note in there that said, you know, well, I know they won't let us do this one because of Gaiman's Sandman, which, of course, had uh, started to come into its popularity at that point. Sure. Yeah, and uh, my response is like, no, that's why they will let us do it because at that point they hadn't quite figured out how to spin off Sandman. Of course, now they have many, many different spin off there. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, um, but you know, if if people are familiar with that uh, that narrative in the first uh, 
first issue, when Morpheus is imprisoned, magically imprisoned, there's a, a little side note about how his uh, his truncated consciousness is uh, bleeding into the, the dreamscape, and it inspired this one guy, Wesley Dodds, to dress up in a um, uh, uh, kind of pseudo version of Morpheus's own uh, uh, battle gear with the helmet, and you know, instead he wears a gas mask, and uh, and so that basically inspired him to become the Sandman in in uh, the real world. So uh, so I said, yeah, let's let's try and do something with that. Now at the time, I had started, I had just been started to become a big fan of uh, uh, hard boiled crime stuff. Uh, sure. Um. Uh, specifically Dashiell Hammett and uh, Raymond Chandler, um, but some of the later writers too, Jim Thompson, uh, David Goodis, stuff like that. Um, anyway, uh, I said to Guy, all right, let's let's try and do something with this. Well, just a couple days later, Guy sent me his initial character sketches where he completely redesigned the character to look much more grounded in reality with this real gas mask and this kind of cyberpunk looking uh, uh, gas gun and damn, it just looked so good. I was like, oh, they're going to go for this for sure. So, you know, I cooked up the, uh, I cooked up the uh, story outline and, uh, you know, our idea was to kind of redefine this character and, uh, and it was all slated to be a uh, four issue um, uh, uh, story arcs so that later when they were put together, it would be about the thickness of a pulp magazine. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And uh, and I wanted to achieve two different goals with that. Um, you know, when you think of hard boiled crime stuff, you think of kind of a lot of uh, you know hardcore kind of right wing philosophy. You know, tough guys, sure. yeah, and broads and shit. And yeah, uh, yeah. You know, even though uh, even though Hammett kind of created that, Hammett was a uh, super progressive. You know, yeah, he, sure. was, he was brought up before the House on American Ethics Committee and refused to testify against other members of the communist party and was spent time in jail and ultimately got out of that by uh, enlisting in the army. And he was stationed in the Aleutian islands, you know, kind of as punishment. But I, I wanted to show this character back in the thirties, you know, you think of uh, progressive and liberalism and all that kind of starting in the sixties. It didn't start in the sixties. It started long not. before that. Of course. Not. Um, so I wanted Roosevelt. to have a kind of progressive character back in the thirties and, uh, Additionally, you know, I took a lot of the specifics from the actual old golden age stuff. Like, for instance, there's a uh, there's an early scene where uh, uh, Wesley's getting ready to go out. I think it might even be the very first golden age story. And he gets ready to put on his Sandman gear and he takes this little doll, this little effigy of himself and tucks it into bed as, as he's going to go out to be the Sandman. And, and he bids it, he says, good night, Mr. Wesley Dodd, because now he's going to go become the Sandman. And I thought, wow, that's cool and weird. So, you know, we had that in the in the book. But then also, unlike most um, Golden Age characters at the time, his girlfriend knew who he was. His girlfriend knew his secret identity. So um, another uh, another kind of comic book norm we wanted to kind of toss on its ear was this, uh, you know, comic book relationships are so angst-ridden, you know. So, uh, you know, oh, I can't be with you or, or you know, even even to the point of, you know, let's let's beat each other up and then fuck, you know. Um, we didn't want that. We wanted to have a a, a, a a relationship between a couple that liked each other, that genuinely liked each other, cared for each other, and supported each other. What a concept! <laughs> um, so all of those things I was real proud of. I think we pulled them all off pretty pretty well. You know, I didn't know until DC's 75th anniversary documentary about Bert Christensen, the the co-creator of, of Golden Age Sandman with Gardner Fox. Yep, mm -hmm, yep. And I didn't know about, he was a World War II, uh, I want to say fighter pilot. Yeah. And died, and died in action and everything. Yep. yep. But I, I, Matt, I had no idea you took the essence of those early stories and and really kind of expanded them into your, your first couple arcs of, yeah. of Sandman. Yep. That, that's fantastic. And, yep. uh, and really, God... Um, not only and, the, and, you know, of course, all those early, uh, all those early superhero stuff, you know, of course the, uh, the, the, the trappings of the superhero world were not yet set, you know, so they, mm -hmm. they more resembled the, uh, pulp magazine stories that it had originally inspired them, specifically the shadow and the spider and the whisperer and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, that really came across in those early uh, Golden Age Sandman stories. It was something we wanted to continue. And we go, Sandman. Boom. There we go. There's uh, sketch number two. And again, uh, right under us on, on the crawl, you get 250, Matt? These are all 250, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. and sh you see the shipping costs uh, to the U.S. and Canada and overseas. You want to uh, email Jim Warden at uh, capshockeyfan at yahoo.com uh, for more information if you want to purchase one of these lovely uh, pictures. But uh, pictures, knucklehead, that I am. <laughs> but but um, honestly, Matt, I, uh, I really oh, – well, tell me about like collaborating then with Steve because he was like the alternate writer on the uh, – I'm he was, with you. Uh, you know, it. Uh, the reason that came about is uh, Steve Siegel, everybody. Steve Siegel, yeah. Um, who has since gone on to uh, uh, work on a whole bunch of other stuff. He's the co-creator of Ben Ten with uh, his uh, fellow writers at uh, uh, Men of Action. Men of Action, absolutely. Uh, Joe Casey and all, and all the guys. Of, uh, uh, Big Hero Six. Um, yes. But. Uh, I knew Steve was a fan of my stuff and I had read a few st things by Steve that I really liked, but it, there was a point where I had to, uh, I had to turn my attention to Grendel at that point. And I knew I didn't have uh, the time or the mental capacity to handle both of these uh, books on a monthly basis. Um, so I brought up to the, to Karen, the idea of having a co-writer. Um, and, uh, uh, so Steve and I got together. He came up to visit me uh, one weekend, and uh, you know we weren't sure it was going to work, but we uh, we decided to give it a shot, and it turned out it worked very very nice. Um, uh, the way we worked that is that I worked at uh, what's sometimes called Marvel style uh, plot and dialogue, whereas I would write the plot for the uh, for the issue. So in, instead of a full script, which uh, in comic book terms means you count down the exact number of panels per page. All the word balloons and captions are already there and written. Has a very distinct description of each and every panel. I would just say, page one. Here's what happens, and then that's left up to the artist to translate and how many panels he wants to break that into or his business. You know, occasionally I'd have a, a spare line of dialogue or whatever here and there just to add a bit of uh, texture and atmosphere. Uh, then Guy or the you know not only there we had a variety of artists on Mystery Theater, but uh, the main returning artist was Guy would do the pencils. And then Steve would add the full script over top of that. Steve would uh, completely generate the dialogue, the captions. Um, but we were we were always in close contact as to what the theme of each uh, storyline was going to be and what we were hoping to achieve with each one. Um, worked out very, very smoothly. Um, well, we I, still fondly remember the experience to this day, both of us. It's Seriously, man, 70 issues. It's a great run. I, I still love it so much. And I, I uh, in fact, uh, someone wanted to know, uh, which, well, they just said, wish there were more. And I don't know if the sh if that's something you guys would ever, or you in particular, would ever want to go back to and write more Wesley and uh, yeah. Diane uh, stuff. Possibly, you know, it does come to a specific ending, kind of. You know, they they go sure. off to Europe, uh, and the war is approaching. Um, True, uh, or it's actually already there, but uh, eh, I don't know. Possibly, you know, um, you know, they did a sequel later that was set in modern time. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, spiritually, it, it moved on to a different uh, character that was in the Iraq War. Yes, exactly, and, and that was interesting. But, but man, I'll tell you, I not only that, but also the way you played with that Golden Age period and introduced like the Crimson Avenger and others into your series, and it really felt like you were the one Vertigo guy that really got to still dip into the DC universe when you wanted. And I'm so thrilled with that because it really was this more textualized look. At the golden age, and I mean, oh, and the reason was I never asked. I just wanted to <laughs> <put it. laughs> I kind of did that on uh, Madame Xanadu too when I was doing Madame Xanadu for uh, hundred percent, man. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh. But yeah, we had we had a lot of fun uh, doing those redefinitions. I mean, one of my favorite ones was when we did the Hour Man. That was a blast. Yes. Um. Uh, and there again, we we uh, we in some, one of the early adventures i i found a, a reference to where initially he uh he used to advertise in the classifieds and he called himself the man of the hour so we we incorporated that you know and and how would somebody come up with the idea to wear a costume as opposed to just your your street duds you know sure um yeah it was great fun and then and then we did a uh a crossover with uh uh I guess you call it a pseudo crossover with James Robinson. James also an old time friend of mine. He worked on, uh, uh, he did the, wrote the very first Grendel Tales uh, 
series. Um, but we uh, decided to coordinate between uh, the two of us. And uh, uh, in our in Mystery Theater, we had uh, uh, an arc called The Mist, which outlined the uh, the origins of The Mist, which was the Golden Age uh, uh, Starman's uh, uh, main one of his main villains. Yes. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, James later had uh, Wesley and Diane, both in their late seventies at that point, show up in the contemporary Starman arc. So it was kind of a it was a crossover that wasn't quite a crossover. Um, but that's, <laughs> no, like, but, that's the way we like doing shit. <laughs> but absolutely, man. And also, was it you or Guy that kind of changed Wesley's look? in his civilian guise. And I mean, you know, uh, again, golden age classic. I mean, you could mistake him for Bruce Wayne. You could make even with Clark Kent, if Clark wasn't wearing his glasses, just totally square jawed, you know, strong I guy. Forget, I forget if it was, I, I'll give the credit to guy because guy was okay. uh, the main uh, uh, visualizer of all of that. Um, but I did know we, we kind of agreed. We didn't want him to be just another version, just another movie star. Um, we wanted him to seem, uh, well, we wanted it to seem like this wasn't something he would gravitate towards if it wasn't for this mystical influence of his dreams being invaded by uh, by the absence of Morpheus from the dreamscape. Sure, um, he's he was an aesthete. He would prefer to sit home and you know read books and um, and not go out and crawl through the night in a in a gas mask and a gun. You know, yeah, he's like uh, potato shaped. I mean, he's this dumpy little guy yeah, yeah. that again uh, achieves the effect. With the gas, with the mask, with yep. the fedora and the yep. and the overcoat and everything, yep. and I love that. And also, I loved in James' story as an old man, uh, you know, had his gun in his little shaky old man hand, yeah. but yeah. he was still the Sandman. And yeah. and and that moment, the Jack Knight is like, oh my god, he's smiling, he's loving yeah. this. Yeah, and he it's had, true. He hadn't given up the fight. Yep. Yeah, and that's and truly, man, that's what made him and Diane, I think, the special characters that you guys infused yeah. in your in your writing and art. I. Yeah. I Really, it's it's the one of my absolute favorite series of that era. And, uh, uh, now another, uh, since we're on that same kind of subject, another uh, project I did uh, uh, in recent years that uh, also uh, covered that same kind of ground was the uh, Django Zorro crossover that I co-wrote with uh, Quentin Tarantino, and it was you know uh, Django is set in uh, uh, just pre Civil War. And the original Zorro stuff is set uh, uh, very early in the uh, 18th or 19th century. Uh, so unless we were going to have a new Zorro, uh, Don Diego had to be old. And uh, and it was fun to portray this. Uh, you know, in fact, the uh, the first captions of the uh, uh, the first issue uh, they're narrated by Bernardo, who is uh, Don Diego's uh, uh, Alfred, Walker and his is Alfred, yeah. Um, and uh, the first caption was, uh, and for some, the call to adventure never fades, you know, and uh, and we really had to kind of get that across. How could how could we make this believable that this old guy was able to do this? Well, you know, it did cause him aches and pains. It was it didn't it didn't come without a cost. Um, but uh, yeah, that was uh, um, when when the possibility to do that project came around. Uh, uh, Dynamite asked me, he said. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about doing a, a Django Zorro crossover. You know, would you be interested in co-writing this with Quentin Tarantino? And I was like, well, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, so and then I kind of forgot about it. And about two months went by and the guys at Dynamite called me and they said, uh, look, we sent Quentin all of your Zorro stuff and he loves it. And he wants you to come down to his place like next weekend. So I did. And I spent two two days at his place. And uh, wow. And uh, we we hacked out this story. And in fact, uh, after the whole first day, I was going to come back the next day uh, for about half a day before I had to catch my flight home. But I went back to my hotel and I sat down and wrote like the first six pages right away. I was like, look, we need to we need to establish what this is going to be, you know, what the uh, what the flavor of it's going to be. And uh, so it all just worked out swimmingly. Um, uh, it was neat because uh, when Quentin first starts working with somebody new, he likes to screen movies with you, so you both get in the same headspace. And he's got. Would you watch? Well, he's got this really cool screening room Sorry. in his house. It's about <laughs> people. And uh, we watched like four different movies. We watched two full length movies. Uh, one was uh, one was the, a swashbuckler called uh, Son of Monte Cristo, which featured okay. a, 
featured a masked, uh, almost Zorro-esque kind of character. Um, okay. But then the other one was the uh, the story we actually based it on. It was one of Sam Fuller's first films. It was called The Baron of Arizona. It starred a very young uh, Vincent Price. Uh, and uh, we felt entitled to uh, adopt the story because it was based on a real story, this real dude that pulled oh. off this incredibly strange and complicated con scheme back in the... Back in uh, the 1800s, and uh, <laughs> it's too long to go into. His name was James Reeves, and it's uh, it, it, you should look it up on Wikipedia, anybody that's interested, because it's fascinating. Uh, and then we watched two uh, chapters of two different Zorro serials as well. Oh, fun. Sure. Yeah. One of the inter neatest parts was uh, all of it was on celluloid. It was all, none of it wow. was on, none of it was on DVD. He has a huge collection. He had a, he had a, uh, uh, he had a, what, a screen master, a, a guy that works. There was a guy back in the booth that was threading these things up all the time. I never saw him. He was invisible. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, but he was there and everything was on, everything was on celluloid. Yeah. Pretty That's cool. amazing. You yeah. know what I, I love, man? I know you have a philosophy about keeping characters in their time periods properly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I really do. If, if you don't mind expanding on that, because you think characters work best in that era that they were created, right? I do, I do. And I, I meet a lot of resistance on this sometimes, but uh, you know, uh, like for instance, the, the one that's easiest for me to go to is the shadow. The shadow works best in the thirties um, for, uh, he works only in an age when uh, every man on the street had a hat on. Otherwise you're like, who's the bozo in the hat, you know? <laughs> And he also only works in a stage when New York City had shadows. I, I don't know when the last time you were in New York City is you were last time you were in New York City. It's lit up like a pinball machine all over the place. You know, there's there's no shadows anywhere. Um, uh, 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 similarly, Batman. Batman could never function in today's world where everybody's carrying a camera and TMZ's everywhere, and no no billionaire could lead a, a secret life like that. You know, um, Superman. Uh, Superman worked with just those pair of glasses because at that, in those days, people didn't get their photo taken all the time. And also fo taking photographs wasn't very quick. So you wouldn't be able to catch many can candid or casual shots of, uh, of Superman. Um, uh, you know, you move ahead and the, the, the kind of superhero zeitgeist that has replaced the secret identity is the X-Men. It's a group of characters with superpowers who are exposed, who aren't allowed to have a secret identity, who, who would like to be anonymous, but can't be. Um, you know, I think we're, we're only now seeing the, uh, the changes for the next stage of this sort of thing. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, that's just my personal take on it. I like them best in the periods they were created in. I'll, I'll give a little plug here to a book I, I, deeply adore, which uh, I'm always surprised how many comic fans don't know about this by the novelist uh, Tom DeHaven. Uh, back when it was Superman's 50th anniversary, they uh, DC contracted him to write a uh, novel, and uh, a Superman novel, and it's called It's Superman. And yep. it's, it's set in the 30s. And it is, it's fabulous. It's very much of its time period. I mean, one of the things I love best about it is <laughs> you know, Clark's not the sharpest tool in the shed. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's just a farm boy. Uh, they make fun of what a shitty speller he is as a reporter. You know? uh, uh, it's a great book. I agree oh, with you, man. Perfect. Yeah. Well, here's, our and, next, uh, here's our next piece. Let, ah, yeah. there you go. So let us, uh, let us uh, talk a bit more about uh, Batman because, again, I love that you took a lot of those early – God, were they eight-page stories, six-page stories? Uh, sure, from yeah. From from detective from the like literally the first handful of Batman stories and again you expanded Batman and the Monster Men certainly comes yeah, to and mind Batman and the Mad Monk too yeah yes again yeah. the thing I like about those is like I said the superhero tropes aren't very established yet and uh, so it very much feels like these guys are just kind of making it up as they go along so it has a certain unfettered freshness to it that uh, you know uh, I look at contemporary superhero comics and boy it's just feels like it's been done before a whole lot you know. Um, uh, uh, but that stuff, not so that stuff again is drawing most of its inspiration from the pulp magazines that inspired the young creators that, uh, were responsible for those early comics. In fact, the very first, um, uh, uh, the very first, uh, Batman story in detective comics number is that 27? 27. Yeah. Detective 27. Um, 
that is utterly and completely a direct ripoff of a shadow novella. Um, it's called, I think it's called The Chemical Syndicate. I was going to say, I, I know Chemical was definitely but in the title. That sounds right. Beat for beat, the visualizations, all of it. It is straight from, it, it's a direct ripoff. Uh, okay, inspiration. <laughs> um, but, uh, but again, I, I, I like the fact that uh, these guys were taking their inspiration from silent movies, from early pulp magazines, not from other comic books, you know, which is just feels like a retread to me, you know. As someone who has written, God, you know, The Shadow, Green Hornet, Grendel, uh, all these characters, like Hunter Rose Grendel, all these characters that are oh, in the oh, 30s. That. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and reminding everyone, too, that you could purchase uh, these sketches uh, from Matt if you go to, uh, and I'm, I'm going to wait now and say that, uh, again, uh, the ship, they're $250 each. They're not up for bid. This is the this is the price. $222 uh, shipping for the U.S., $70 for Canada. Overseas, contact Jim Warden at ca CapsHockeyFan at Yahoo.com. That's it. Yep. All right, commercial over. So tell me the comparisons of all these great heroes that you've worked on that are flitting around in 1930s New York, if not Gotham society. And let's let's talk about. Um, in, well, let's start with uh, Bruce Wayne and, and Hunter Rose. And and I mean, obviously, one's a hero, one's a villain. But yeah, just tell me about the men. Well, the, the funny thing with that is uh, when I did the Batman Grendel crossover back in the eighties, you know, that was, uh, that was uh, kind of put together by Kamiko, my initial publisher in coordination with DC. And uh, at that point we had just finished the Christine Spar storyline. And uh, so my natural inclination was, to, and that was such a popular run. My natural inclination was to make it a female Grendel uh, to fight Batman. And, uh, and I turned on a, a a pitch for it and it was awful and luckily my my uh uh editor at the time later my sister-in-law diana schutz uh had the had the balls to tell me this is terrible because <laughs> uh, it was too convoluted you know it was uh I, I i didn't in my mind i couldn't really meld the two worlds and so grendel was a fictional character in batman's world that this woman becomes obsessed with so it was just too long getting to the good shit you know and she said look Hunter Rose, Bruce Wayne, they're not that different. Just do that. And it was just like, boink, you know, the light went off inside my head. <laughs> and, you know, they're certainly uh, uh, variations of a theme, aren't they? You know, the, the, or the urbane, uh, the urbane uh, uh, man about town, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you were saying there about uh, the fact that I've worked on all these characters. Uh, you know, I did a whole bunch of this stuff for, uh, in addition to Batman and Grendel. I did a whole bunch of uh, these sort of uh, characters for uh, Dynamite. Yes, uh, and uh, so the Shadow did, Run was great. Your, your I, Green Hornet I did Run. The Shadow. I did the Green Hornet Year One. I did the Spirit. Absolutely, <laughs> Spirit was Zora. amazing. Again, Zora. Yes, all these guys are guys in a hat and a cloak. They bear, they bear a certain similarity to each other. And so, to me, it was like, how do I how do I figure out how to make each one of them separate and different? You know. Uh, so, like for instance, uh, you know, Don Diego is a uh, uh, Don Diego de la Vega is a is an aristocrat, you know, an aristocrat who uh, who uh, has egalitarian uh, uh, leanings and and wants uh, justice for all the people, not just for uh, not just for the rich. Sure. Um, uh, Britt Reed, on the other hand, is uh, the son of a newspaper man and the owner of a newspaper. So. Uh, tried to incorporate a certain amount of um, the presence of the newspaper in uh, uh, the Green Hornet's dealings. Uh, like if you get to the end of the Green Hornet year one, you'll realize that uh, uh, journalism had as much to do with bringing down the main bad guy as <clears throat> the Green Hornet's uh, uh, vigilante activities. Um, the spirit, you know, of course, has its own uh, different vibe that I tried to hit, you know. Um, <laughs> so even though each of these characters bear a certain similarity, if you search hard enough, you know, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can individualize each of them. You know, for me, the shadow was the, the golden nugget in that bucket. Cause, uh, I was a huge shadow fan from way back when. So it was kind of, when I finally got the chance to get my hands on him, he's a complex character because, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, several different versions of the shadow. You know, the purists point to the uh, pulp magazines, but at the same time, the radio show that ran during the 30s and 40s, I would say, was uh, reached a far broader audience. No question. 
But of course, that's a completely different shadow. The shadow in the pulps couldn't turn invisible. Right. Um, but then, you know, as I got ready to do my shadow, I realized there's a whole section of the audience that might be buying this that would know him from the Alec Baldwin film sure. in, in the 90s, you know. And uh, and there's there's good stuff in that film. I think ultimately it, it has a very kind of confused uh, uh, sense of tone. But uh, but there's good stuff in there. I like the uh, I like the. Uh, the inclusion of the fact that the, you know, our main character had a bad side at one point. He's almost doing this out of atonement. You know, he is, he has learned to harness his personal shadow to confront uh, what evil lurks in the hearts of men, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Tell me about the interplay between Batman and the shadow, because going back to Denny O'Neill, when he was writing both uh, comics back in the seventies, I really did love this yeah, connection he that he established. Topics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, in that case, the the Batman uh, directly acknowledged his uh, his uh, creative uh, or, or his uh, the debts of his origin to the Shadow. He um, saw the he saw the Shadow in action when he was a young boy with his parents. Yeah, it's yep. pre Joe Chill or whoever yep. you decide was the killer of Bruce's parents. But yep. yeah, I, I you know uh, that was great, and I also loved. I remember in Denny's story where the Shadow presented him with a forty five, and yeah. Batman's like. Yeah, thanks. That's okay. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell me about the interplay in your when you were writing uh, Lamont and Bruce Wayne, and what, what you know, or I should say, Kent Allard, I suppose. And yeah, uh, well, and Bruce I did, Wayne. Uh, I didn't work on the uh, the Batman Grendel cross or the Batman Grendel crossover. The, 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 no, the, you didn't the, do Batman Shadow yeah, Batman Shadow crossovers, but you know, of course, I do compare and contrast the characters. You know, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't. I don't adhere to the kind of psychotic approach to each of these characters. Certainly I would say uh, Ken Allard's a little darker than uh, Bruce. Um, sure. But Bruce isn't, uh, you know, the uh, the recent trailer for the new Batman movie just came out and the guy says to him, you know, you know, what are, what are you? And he says, I am vengeance. And that's not my take on Batman at all. Um, Batman isn't out for vengeance. If, if he was out for vengeance, he'd be the punisher. Um, okay, sure. He's out. He's out to make sure that what happens to him never happened to anybody else. He's out to ensure that nobody goes to bed without their loved ones that night, still in the world, like he had to do. Yep. Um, he, you know, again, his the modern take on the character. I was talking with Nick uh, Darrington about this recently, and we were both kind of lamenting the fact that uh, there's not much of the Dark Knight detective in the current take on Batman. He's not very detective. -y. He's interesting. Pretty much a paramilitary character at this point. Okay. And uh, and uh, you know, Batman's the reason he dresses up in that costume is not for armor. It's to scare people. It's to scare bad guys. And, you know, if he has to resort to armor, like. Truthfully, I think in Batman's mind, if he has to punch the guy, he's doing something wrong. You know? like, the costume didn't work. He didn't. He didn't get to terrorize the guy. You know the right way. Sure. Um, uh, uh, similarly, uh, you know, even though uh, uh, the shadow never really hesitates when it's time to you know pull the trigger on somebody, uh, I don't consider him just a laughing maniac. You know. Um, uh, he too is is out to uh, uh, kind of expose, you know, pluck the weed of crime, you know, pluck sure. uh, pluck the uh, the efforts of bad people. Um, again, if he was just an executioner, there'd be a trail of bodies all over the place, and that's not really what happens in the stories. You know, when he's backed against the wall, yeah, the guns come out and he lets them have it, but uh, but he doesn't just shoot for no reason. I understand. Yeah, that was honestly, man. I, I I've been neglecting the chat because I really wanted to hear those those contrasts between some of these characters. So that was great. I'm gonna go back now and I see. Uh, oh uh, well, first of all, yeah, Gore Vidal says as uh, in 1983 as a kid, I discovered Grendel and V for Vendetta around the same time. These protagonists in comics uh, changed my expectations for what a comic book should be. And then uh, Lipex says, "Love Sandman Mystery Theater it was one of my all time favorite series." Uh, uh, he says D Diane and uh, Wesley, one of the best, you know, was the best relationship in comics. I totally agree. They were yep. a team. They yep. were a team. Yep. So, oh, and also, yes, was there a character? For also, Sam if you go back, let me just point out, if you go back and look uh, at that run, uh, we styled it so that every 12 issues at the end of every year, 
uh, their relationship went through one significant change. It advanced in some fashion. Yeah. Again, trying to give a, a real world and a real life approach to uh, the sort of relationships that tend to remain static and unchanging in, in uh, uh, traditional comics, you know. Did editorial ever not allow you to use a specific character in Sandman Mystery Theater? Not in Sandman. They got upset in uh, uh, when I was using uh, John Jones in uh, uh, Madame Xanadu. Okay. Uh, so they, they just said no? <laughs> they, made, they made you change it? Huh? They made you change it? It was too late. They only realized after we were already three or four episodes or three or four issues in. So, uh, yeah. That's fantastic, man. Yeah, they Jesus. made a change. Uh, there's a scene where uh, uh, she gets uh, she gets dumped in the river, and uh, John Jones, who has been throughout the whole story in his uh, uh, kind of uh, fedora hat disguise that he you know was throughout the fifties. Yeah, uh, he dives in to save her, and we see this uh, green Martian hand come up to grab her and pull her out. And they made us change the green to like teal blue. Like, I don't know what the fuck that was supposed to achieve, but you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, honestly, man, no, those all those nods to all those uh, golden age, and then obviously with John, you know, silver age characters, or like they're in front of Grant's gym, and somebody just mentions Ted. And, you know, they're talking about Wildcat. I just mm -hmm. love that stuff. Scott Dunbear is watching us, man, and is saying how much Thanks, he's man. enjoying looking at your sketches today. Thanks, Great buddy. stuff. Very cool. That's awesome. Um, oh, uh, here, uh, uh, Mike Rell wrote a novelization of John Sable Freelance. Have you considered writing one for Grendel, Devil by the Deed? Now, I know there was a Grendel novel a few years back as well. That was a Grendel Prime novel, and that was written by Greg Rucka. Yes, it did. Novelist. Uh, way back in the day, though, way back, uh, again, around the time of the Christine Spars storyline, uh, there was an editor at Ballantyne, a woman at Ballantyne, uh, who read and loved the, uh, she liked Devil by the Deed, and she loved the Christine Spars storyline. And so they commissioned me to write a Grendel novel. It was going to be basically what that guy just suggested there, a novelization of Devil by the Deed, fleshed out. And there again, I wrote the whole thing and I turned it in and Diana Schutz told me, this is terrible. <laughs> 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 and so I finally, uh, I finally just decided, you know, my medium is comics. You know, I know a lot of comics writers want to get into writing film. I don't really have those aims. That's not my medium. I, I like to say to people, I'm, I, I'm not a, I'm not what I would call a great writer. I'm not what I would call a great artist, but I feel like I'm pretty great at combining those two things into a synthesis that's greater than the sum of its holes or the whole is, you know, I'm with than, you, but yeah. some of it's all, absolutely. It's only one hole, but God bless you. It's yeah. all good. Yeah. No, that absolutely. And, um, well, you know, people always ask and look at There's that. Awesome. Outstanding, man. So we got Grendel, Superman, Batman, and well, I'll, flip them. I'll flip through them all again here. Yeah. So, this is the most recent one. Grendel. Lovely. Oops. There he is. The dark Knight. Looks great. Looks amazing. Here, I should actually hear. We go we'll solo you. Shame on me. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. Gray Wesley Dodds. Look at that. Sandman. Outstanding. I have a quick sketch uh, that you did for me of Wesley back in the day. And a uh, fantastic Superman. Absolutely, man. All iconic. All, all with that Wagner stamp that uh, you put on everything you do, Matt. I mean, and seriously, it's so great to reread uh, Mage and early Grendel. And like you said, watch the evolution of your art and your storytelling. And uh, well, my, you know. my approach to my art has always been to kind of keep things simple, you know. Um, um, you know, there's a I, I often refer to there's a famous quote by Edgar Allan Poe that uh, when it comes to a short story, every word has to tell. And in comics, I feel the same way. Every element has to tell. Every word has to tell, but also every line has to tell. And uh, I don't know. Too many lines is boring to me. I, I like it simple. I like it direct. Uh, you know, uh, some of the best, uh, some of the greatest samurai were also not only great warriors, they were great artists. If you go look up some samurai art, it's really, really lovely. And uh, what's powerful about it is that they would try and make each brushstroke brief and descriptive to the utmost degree. And so their philosophy was that every brushstroke should be as, uh, as, as, uh, as life bringing and as creative as a sword stroke is destructive. 
and uh, and I really tried to always take that approach to my stuff as well. You know, I like to have a certain lushness to things, but I like to keep the uh, the actual elements to a very simple degree. You know, uh, I'm the same with the sort of music I like. I love you know uh, punk rock and garage rock and stuff that's uh, of a very basic nature. And yet, uh, digs hard to the, digs deep to the uh, heart of the emotion it's trying to convey. It comes through, Matt. Absolutely, and uh, God, it was a pleasure, uh, you know, watching all this stuff. I'm going to bring Bill in because uh, they're going to make me jump to the next room and uh, talk to uh, D- David Mack. But I want to I want to thank you for, as always, a great conversation. And when um, the the Grendel uh, series gets back on the schedule. Come on, Word Balloon as well, and uh, sure, sure. We'll, Again, we'll talk uh, more April, about this. April's the premiere of when it when it picks back up. So okay, but yeah, we can talk maybe in February when it's time to order through previews or whatever. You know how to find me. So fantastic, Bill. I'll let you uh, hand off. I'll hand off to you and uh, everybody. If you want to watch uh, another conversation with me and uh, David Mack, we'll be uh, doing that at the top of the hour. But thank no, you very much. Man. I haven't seen it in a long time either. Absolutely, man. Always a pleasure, buddy. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, John. Hey, Matt. It's hey, Bill. It's a doing? pleasure to finally meet you, man. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, we've been emailing enough, you know, and I forgot. I'm going to show you something. I actually have an original piece of art from you. I mean, and you'll laugh. This is probably in the first year that I started collecting original art, and I really didn't have any savvy. I didn't quite understand the whole process. You know, you're paying for something, or and sometimes, you know, I, I was reading stories about how you could go up and get a free sketch or something like that, and it was at San Diego. It's probably like 2002 or three and i saw you and there was no line in front of your booth so i walked up to you and, and i had like a sketch pad and i said you know I, you know being dumb i just handed it to you i'm like you know you're like what do you want me to do with this and i'm like uh i'd like uh something from mage right remember i told you it's my favorite thing and so this is what you drew for me oh yeah okay you know and uh well in keeping with that so uh uh, uh, I don't know if you were checking in earlier watching what we were doing, but I, I was working on sketches that were for sale uh, while we were doing this chat. Mm-hmm. So I do that. I do these finished sketches here. I'll show you the Superman one I did. Very nice. There we go. So, you know, I have these that are very finished kind of sketches, but I've always had this attitude of, you know, anybody that brings me a board or one of my books that they want signed, uh, I'm more than happy to do those uh, those sort of quickie doodles, you know, I, I do those for free for the asking anytime, anywhere, no problem. Um, because okay. you know, I feel it's, uh, it, they, they, you know, they literally take me seconds. I feel that's the least I can do for somebody that's interested in my work and supports my work by buying my books. Right. Well, I can tell you, you know, back then I, I just didn't know what, you know, what was the right etiquette for those kinds of things. I look at yeah, it now and, and I would yeah, never. It changes from person to person, basically. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's what I've, I've gathered. But, you know, today it's like I would never hand a sketchbook over to an artist and say do a, do a sketch but i know that's totally common and that's it happens a lot it's the expectation of a lot of fans but at the same time having having worked closely with with many artists and everything you know that I've, over the years now it's like i i would never not want to hand over some cash you know as part of a sketch you were going to do for me or you know i'd rather have one of your one of those finished pieces that you're showing right there well so. you know those little uh those little uh pieces like the piece I did for you there, they are almost, in my mind, I think of them as uh, uh, visual signatures almost, you know, uh, like especially, you know, uh, uh, if you want a Grendel, if you want a Kevin Matchstick, if you want a Batman, you know, I peel those guys off really fast. <laughs> so that's, right, deep, right. that's deep in the, the genetic memory of my hand at this point, you know. <clears throat> but again, I, uh, I feel no... I'm, Absolutely overjoyed to do that for anybody that asks. So uh, once regular conventions start up again and anybody sees me there, don't hesitate to bring me a backing board. Or even better, I like doing it in, in the actual books because then it's uh, you know it's uh, it's more of a it's more of a uh, identified keepsake, you know. Yeah. Oh, without question. Absolutely. No, that's good to know. I mean, I I imagine every artist is probably different on what they're willing to do. But yeah, like you're saying, it's a signature. I mean, that's like Simonson when he would, you know, he'd draw that and he'd put like the Thor frog or something inside mm-hmm. the O or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's just like a, it's all comes up from memory when you do it. I know. I, I think that literally took you like 30 seconds. To yeah. I was going to say it helps for us guys to draw fast, like me and Simonson. <laughs> uh-huh, exactly. No, I've got, and I've gotten, you know, a couple things from him too. And it's you know, about the same, you know, yeah, yeah. but, um, but no, so I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I hope the panel went well because I was having, there's big storms in the area. And so I got knocked off the internet twice. And where, where are you, Bill? I'm in Northeast Ohio. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, yeah, we were, I was kicked off two times and I kind of got them through the side. I was uh, managing the Simonson panel. So that's why we were having so many. John John got bumped once in the middle of ours, but Chad jumped in and took over for him. So yeah, it all went fine. All right. Well, I talked with Chad and he's, and I was like, man, I'm so glad you were able to do that for us. And I didn't realize that you and he have done the hero initiative. uh, Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I I thought I was throwing him into a crazy situation and he was like, nah, you know, I've talked to Matt Mm -hmm. many times. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate you, you, everything that you've done, you know, for, for the show and being a part of the panel. That's uh, Sure. Yeah. My pleasure, man. And thanks for organizing this. I think, you know, in these days when uh, everybody's really hungry for a convention experience, I think this has gone over pretty well with a lot of people. Um, yeah. No, it's, we, we've had a good attendance. Um, we peaked at, like, earlier today at over 1,000 people on the site at one time. Right on. So, and I think I haven't really checked the sales since about – uh, noon, but we sold over seven hundred thousand dollars in. Oh, wow! I know. I was like, I, that's, that's much more than we sold on the first one. You know. It's yeah. Right on. Right on. Well, right on. Right. Well, Jim. Jim told me you're planning one possibly in May. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll do another. One. I'm going to do them every six months. I mean, because oh, right. I, I don't think cons are really going to come back in full force even you know this next year. So right I think that, I think it, I might as well keep doing these, and I'm enjoying them. You know, it's been a yeah. lot of fun, and that's the important part. You know. As soon as, yeah. it becomes, uh, as soon as it becomes a chore, you should think about maybe not. But yeah, <laughs> right, right. Oh no. Well, I used to own a con and uh, it, uh, Big Wow Comic uh, Comic Con when it was. Oh in. yeah, I've heard of Big Wow. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was it was a lot of fun, but man, it killed you. You know, that yeah. doing a, doing a brick and mortar one. This is a little bit easier. You know, I just kind of I, I've got a couple weeks lead time to kind of prep it and organize the panels and things, but. Uh, so it is a lot easier, but this, uh, it's gotten busy enough. I'm definitely not going to do it by myself next time. I'm going to yeah, bring, yeah. bring in some helpers at different points, but, yeah. um, but like I told you, I mean, you know, I, I don't not word balloon is uh, John, such a better interview than I am, but I did want to say at least to your face that, I mean, for me, you like really made comics fun again, you know, in the eighties when, like I told you, elementals and major were like my favorite books. And it was just because they weren't the, you know, the standard, marvel or dc book coming out and it just you know it made me i remember pulling them off the newsstand at my uh you know at my my local comic shop and it really just it blew me away to see independent work that was done so well you know it wasn't some little cheapo ash can uh you know thing that you really weren't going to appreciate when you saw those books it just you knew that there was so much care put into them and and it it was you know you really kind of changed my path because i was getting really bored with the same old, I was reading Thor and X-Men and it was just at that point in time, wasn't really fun for me. And you, you uh, definitely made comics fun for me. I we, really you know, our, my approach has always been uh, the comics have to be fun for me. You know, I, I, I do this cause I, I grew up loving comics, you know, and I love, I love the experience of reading a comic. Um, but, uh, but it's why I've always tried to push myself in different directions because uh you know, why I keep changing Grindel specifically over and over and over again. You could say Mage changes pretty regularly, too, during the course of this trilogy. But uh, um, because my, my thought is, it, if it's not interesting to me, it's not going to be interesting to my readers. You know, if I feel like I'm, I'm treading water, they're going to know it. Um, and so I, I hope to keep going, as, you know, till, until I break down and die. You know, my, uh, my ideal for this is Charles Schultz, who, uh, you know, he... he he finished peanuts. He laid down his pen and he died three days later. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, yeah, there, no, that's, that's, a, that is true. I've read that, but I mean, that's a, uh, that's a great way to look at it, right? You're going to, you're going to draw it till you drop. Yep. Right? Yep. Pretty much so. Yep. Or create till you drop. You've written yeah, a lot yeah. too. So. Yep. But uh, again, I, I sincerely appreciate it. I'll, I'll be talking with Jim after the, the show about some stuff too. So, um, you know, if there's ever anything that I can do for either of you, you know, just please let me know anything you want me to share, anything I can, you know, help promote. I, you know, I know that, you know, with Jim being your rep, he, he doesn't send out a lot of PR news, you know, newsletter mm-hmm. for me. But I'll prod him a little bit because okay, you know, sure. At this day and age, it's well, like I'm, uh, I'm I'm totally on board. If you want to have me back in May, we'll we'll be uh, we'll yeah. be with something. Yeah, fantastic. That would be great. All right, uh, Matt. Thanks again, and thanks to everybody who's tuned in. I really appreciate it. Um, like uh, John said, there's a David Max panel going on, Paulo Rivera after that, and uh, and then John Lucas after that. And then I'll do a con re- recap at 7 o'clock uh, Eastern t- tonight as well. So, again, Matt, thank you very much. And uh, take care. Thanks for